ultimately the nation of Israel. Their unbelief is irrational, as sin always is. This is why, even as Christians, but when people get caught up in sinful lifestyles, they're blinded to the reality of their sin. And this is why many times people who are walking right with God and understand the scriptures can look at the things that people are saying and doing going, that makes absolutely no sense. Because sin is always irrational. It doesn't make sense. And so was their unbelief. Why would you reject Jesus? After everything you've seen him do, pleading, raise Lazarus from the dead, why would you reject him as God? That's a question right here we need to come to grips with this morning. What does it take to take God at all of his word? Do we believe God in everything he says or not? Is there any element of unbelief, even in our hearts as Christians? Are there certain elements of biblical doctrine that we struggle with? Maybe there are some here this morning you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. Listen, we can go on for hours, and I will not. But understand, it's, it's a very, while deep and simplistic to understand that the God of the Bible is the only true living God. You say, well, how can you validate that? What separates what you believe from everybody else? Isn't that kind of arrogant? No, it, because it has nothing to do with me. It's placing our belief in the validity of who Jesus is because he's the one who rose from the dead. Nobody else did that. He is God. He is God alone. And because he did that, because he fled God, because he rose again, he's the only one who has authority to forgive your sin. If you're here this morning and you're even challenging or dealing and struggling with the validity of God, hear me based upon who God is. He is the only one who forgives you of your sin. And it's the only rational, logical, philosophical, theological, whatever logical you want to throw on there that makes sense. It's God himself, Jesus. And he bled and died for you. That's why he came. Remember? Remember what he said about the voice to the people who were unbelieving? He said, the voice was for your sake, not mine. I'm not here to impress you. He said, the voice was so that you would believe that I am who I claim to be and that you would believe in the Son of God for your salvation. That's the same for you this morning. He sent His Son for you. He bled and died for you. He rose again for you. Will you place your trust and belief in Him? And now verses 38 through 41, after it says that they wouldn't believe, verse 38, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, and he's quoting from Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed our report, and of whom has the honor of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He, being God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke with him. Very quickly, just so we understand, because this is not the anchor of our text this morning. These verses are not talking about God predetermining someone's eternal dwelling place. This simply is a fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah from 750 years prior to the time of Jesus Christ in what God knew. God's omniscience. He knew that his own chosen people, the nation of Israel, would reject him. Well, how could someone who was chosen still reject him? It's called free will. This was God's nation. He knew that they were going to reject him. We see that again referencing Ezekiel. Okay, and we see it here. So you're going, well, it says that they could not believe. Simply put, it's this. Hardened hearts and spiritual blindness are part of God's punishment. When we reject him, when we resist him, when we're disobedient to him, when we rebel against him and his word, when we resist the evidence that is there, hardened hearts and darkened minds are a response. So the reason that they could not believe is because they would not believe. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 43. He was talking to the, the, the leaders then. He said, why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot, or you are not able to listen to my word. 
The word able in the Greek, the best way to translate that response is, you're not willing to listen to my word. You don't want the truth. You want your own ideology and philosophy and theology. And so it was with the people. But what do we, what do we draw from the disobedience of the people? This, that God's sovereign purpose and plan will always be fulfilled regardless of people's reactions and response to his truth. Why does that give us encouragement this morning? Because no matter what anybody does or says, no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what happens today in our personal lives, as well as our national lives, worldwide, nationwide, no matter what happens, God already knows about it, and it will be used to fulfill His plan and purpose. Aren't you? I got one! <laughs> Nothing is out of God's control. Take rest in it. If you're going through a difficult time, personally, in your family, whatever, God has a purpose in it. If there's something that you're going through that you don't comprehend and can't understand, God has a purpose in it. And His purpose will be fulfilled, even if it's an attack by the enemy. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that God says, you know what? You're going to throw Joseph into a den. You're going to beat him with a stripping of the coat. You're going to sell him in slavery. You're going to lie to your father. He's going to be lied about again in Egypt. But it will fulfill my purpose of delivering you who did all these things. And Joseph, <laughs> he had the, the, the blessing of not arrogantly standing before his brothers, but seeing the fulfillment of God's purpose years later. Yes. But he remained faithful. Hey, what about Paul? They kicked him out of the, the cities. They stoned him to the point that they thought that he was dead. He was shipwrecked. He, I, you know my feelings about that, man. Never been a shark attack on land. Just put the point in that. But could you imagine floating along in those waters day and night? Could you imagine all those things that the Paul's going, but I know you got a purpose in it. Could you imagine being John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11? Hey, I'm going to send two of my disciples there. What do you want us to say to Jesus? Ask him if he's really the Messiah. Or if there's somebody else that we should be looking for because <laughs> I'm the one that's supposedly fulfilling the prophecy by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, about the voice coming out of the wilderness. What am I doing in this jail cell? Jesus said, go back and tell him. We're going to touch more on that passage in a little bit. But he said, go back and tell him the things that you see in here. There's only the Son of God can do that. God always has a purpose. That purpose will always be fulfilled. So in spite of the rejection, now we get to verses 42 and 43. This is where it really gets good. That was the intro. All right. Nevertheless, aren't you thankful for the neverthelesses of Scripture? Nevertheless, that is in spite of the people and their disbelief, and the rejection and the rebellion. Nevertheless, even amongst the rulers, that's kind of neat, even amongst the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So in verse 42, you see, in spite of the rejection of some, many of the rulers still believed in Jesus, but they didn't confess Jesus. Confess in the Greek means to speak the same thing. To accord or agree with. To declare openly by speaking out freely. You know, unfortunately, there are many Christians who believe in Jesus, but they're not willing to align themselves and speak openly with everything Jesus says. Because it's too harsh. It's not popular. It's not politically correct. The reality that we have to understand in not just believing in Jesus, but in confessing Jesus it's never been a popularity contest, folks. The Pharisees openly, uh, let me back up. Let me spend a minute on this for a second. 
We said that many won't profess belief in Jesus. They won't openly speak or align themselves with Jesus and his word and what they say. He says about everything. Many won't speak out freely or align themselves in everything that Jesus says because it runs contrary to how they want to live the faith. Remember we talked about this, about treating God's word like a smorgasbord? And remember what we already said out of 2 Peter 3 about distorting the scriptures to our own destruction. We think we know what the Word of God says, or we want the Word of God to say a certain thing to support a certain choice and decision in life's time, but this doesn't add up. And why? Verse 43. Why were they willing to believe in Jesus, but not confess Jesus, openly declare Jesus, openly speak up for Jesus, rely on themselves with Jesus? What's it say? Because they desired the praise of man, they actually loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. Let me say this as plainly as I can so that there is no mistaking. So we, we understand this this morning. If we choose to draw a hard line in following Jesus and adhering to God's righteousness, and interpreting God's word literally in our lives, we will incur the criticism and wrath of man. Let me read you a quote that I got just yesterday in a text message. The individual had no idea, just in the sense of what he was preaching on. In this day and age, we don't need a church that's right when the world is right, but a church that is right when the world is wrong. We have too many Christians and too many churches that look like, sound like, and act like the rest of the world. And one of the reasons is because we strayed away from this word. And one of the consequences of straying away from this word, we want the praise of man more than we want the praise of God. Do any of you remember in middle school or elementary school or junior high school, do you guys remember the, the notes or stuff that you're going to show your age if you, if you agree with this. I'm just warning you. Remember the, if you like so-and-so, check this box, yes or no, and you would pass a note. Remember that? Yeah. And, and it could be, I was, I'll be honest, I know, probably not very nice, but I would get bored in class. School wasn't my favorite thing to do. Um, so it was funny because I'm like, hey, you pass a note on my desk without a name on it? I'm reading it. So I used to get a kick out of that. Do you think Danny is cute? I'm like, not really. <laughs> and they would just be like, oh, you know, check yes or no. Well, I'm checking no on that one. And of course, oh, that was hilarious. They, they didn't think it was very funny. You guys remember that? Remember the check yes or no boxes and then apply to a number of things and notes and stuff like that? You know what that's evolved into today? The like and dislike button on social internet. Do you know? What so many people are focused on today, we have a desire more than ever before in the history of man to garner the approval of somebody else's opinion, whether it be um, what we've done, a good deed, whether it be academic or athletic accomplishments, um, whether it be um, a political state, whatever it is, we want people to hit the like button. And unfortunately, that's delved into our spiritual lives, our theology and our churches. We're more concerned about people liking the message of Jesus, or should I say we're not as concerned about people liking the message of Jesus as we are about offending man. We, we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. We don't want to offend. We want to make sure everybody comes back. Because after all, the indication of a successful ministry or an active church or an active life, it's how many people we have in the church, right? Exactly right. You can, have a, you can have a group of people and not have a church. You can have a large gathering and not glorify God. And remember, Jesus did this. But the point that I'm trying to make here is not that God wants us to be belligerent. He does want us to be bold. And being bold for Jesus means that there are going to be times when we open the line ourselves with him. 
that people are going to be offended. When we choose to follow after his standards, people are going to be offended, and some people aren't going to get it. Some people aren't going to understand it. Some people will even move on. The Pharisees openly and adamantly rejected Jesus because his words didn't align with their own theology and ideology. And it's the same way to be today. Many people reject God's word, God's church, God's messages because they want everything to adhere to their own comfort level and preferences while believing that they're the ones who are being godly just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were adamant that they were right. The religious leaders were absolute. They were, they had, they were, oh, I got it. And, the, and so the people that followed after him. Well, Jesus came along and he contradicted a large part of what they said. Because his words were God's. They didn't like that. And so for this, it, it, remember, you're looking at before Jesus was born, how many years at the end of the Old Testament to the New Testament when God had spoken? 400. That's a lot of days to formulate your own beliefs. That's a lot of time to start coming up with, you know what, I think, I, I, I believe this part, I think this is what we need to, I think this is what God meant. But there's a reason why God went silent in the first place, and it was because of the continual rebellion of his own people. So how do we determine if we're seeking the praise of God or man? How do we do that? There are three reasons. Three ways, I should say. Three ways that we determine if we're seeking the praise of God, we're seeking the praise of man. Number one is our fruits. What are our fruits producing? If we constantly find ourselves getting into sinful inclinations, sinful thoughts, sinful words, sinful lifestyles, sinful decisions, there's a pretty good chance we're seeking the pleasure and the praise of man rather than the praise of God. And why is that? Let us remind ourselves, who is the man we most want to please and receive the praise of? Ourselves. We want that justification of our own behavior. And so many times what we do is we go looking for other people's approval of that. If our lives are producing fruits that are contrary to God's word, you're not seeking the praise of God. Look over to Matthew chapter 12. Hold your place here in John. Look in two places in the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12 in verses 33 through 37. Jesus says in verse 33 of Matthew 12, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. You know what he's saying there? Get on one side of the fence or the other. Verse 34, brood of vipers. Well, that's not very politically correct, Jesus. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You hear that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's saying, what's coming off your lips in some capacity is already taking root in your, in your heart. Jesus doesn't necessarily say, if it's coming out of your mouth, it's already in your heart. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. And that's awfully black and white. Verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Go back one chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. This is what we referenced earlier, different context. You now know it was John the Baptist who sent through his messages while he was in prison. He asked Jesus, are you really the one that we are waiting for, the Messiah? Should we be looking for someone else? Jesus sent him back, tell him about the things that you've seen and heard. And then he turns and he says, what have you been looking for when you're looking for John the Baptist? What was it that you're looking for? And he basically says, he's greater than the prophets. But then he starts, Jesus starts turning to the heart of the issue that I believe that didn't just exist in John the Baptist's heart of doubt, but also in other people. And look at what Jesus says here in verse 13 of Matthew 11. He says, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. In other words, it's not just John that I'm glorifying here. You had the same message before John. He says in verse 14, and if you are willing to receive it, 
It sounds an awful lot like free will. He is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? Here's the comparison. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. So in other words, we played nice music for you. You didn't want that. You didn't want to dance. We played sad music for you and tried crying with you like you're at a funeral. You didn't want that. Then he moves to verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say he has a demon. So John came. He, he obeyed the feast. He didn't drink any wine. He didn't do any of those things. And you, conv you, you convicted him of being demon possessed. Now look at what he says in verse 19. The son of man, Jesus, came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. So they accuse Jesus of, of overeating, being a glutton, and being a drunk. But he did the opposite of what John did. They weren't happy with John. They weren't happy with Jesus. They weren't happy with whatever the music was being played. In other words, what Jesus was pointing out is there's some people who are never going to be happy no matter what you do or what you say. So if that's the case, why don't we focus on pleasing the one that is always glorified and receives joy when we obey him? Why waste time trying to please man? I know that hurts. That doesn't mean that we have a license to be a jerk. Okay? But I'm telling you that God himself, through Jesus, he's trying to get us to understand here the focus. And we're going to get the more of it. But look at what Jesus said in verse 19. Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But look at what Jesus, this is the only time in this context that he references what they accused him of. By the way, they also accused him of being demon possessed before. Don't forget that. But wisdom is justified by our children. You know what Jesus is saying? If what you say is true of me, then the fruits of my life will bear witness of that. You want to know the truth of people's lives, who they are? Look at the fruits they bear. Don't believe everything you hear. Is that really in alignment with the life that they live? Is that really in alignment with the fruits that they produce? Is that really who they are? That's what Jesus said. But he was emphasizing here also about pleasing man versus pleasing God. He says no matter what you do, they're not going to be happy with it. So we need to look at this. The first way that we determine if we're seeking the praise of God or the praise of man is... What fruit are our actions producing? The second way that we determine if we're seeking the praise of God or man is our focus. Who or what are we most concerned about? Hold your place here, go over to Galatians chapter 1. We read this, do y'all remember this just a little while ago? I mean, it's not been that long. Galatians 1 verse 10, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, or do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, underline still. Why? Because at one point in Paul's life, he was worried about pleasing men. He says, if I still please men, I would not be a bond servant that is a willing slave of Jesus. This is very interesting because this is very early in this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. Why did Paul make this statement? Why did he issue this question to the church, to the believers in Galatia? Well, look at verse number one. You get for a, a beginning of a clue. Paul, an apostle, parenthetical reference, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You know what Paul is, is saying there? My affirmation and validity as an apostle of Jesus Christ is not contingent on your acceptance of it. Me being an apostle of Jesus and giving you what I'm about to give you does not rest on your acceptance of it. God called me into this ministry. God is going to fulfill the ministry. That's the first thing. And then he gets to verse number six. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Jesus, for the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Remember in chapter three and verse one, what Paul said? He said, oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you have turned aside from the gospel? Do you, let's break this down. Do you want to know what Paul is saying? What's the matter 
matter with y'all? This is not the gospel that God has told us to live by. You're not acting like a Christian. This is not what I taught you to do. And so because of that, Paul knew the response where it was kind of going, who does he think he is? Where's he get off? You know what Paul says? Do you think I'm here to please you or to please God? I'm not here for a popularity contest. That's what Paul was saying. I'm here to deliver God's truth. And if we are going to live by that truth, if we are going to make decisions based on that truth, from our church, to our homes, to our businesses, to our individual lives, to our entertainment, to whatever it is, if we shoot, we are going to offend people. We're going to draw the ire of Why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you, why are you here? What, but that doesn't make any sense, not according to your standards. But my God has called me to do this. Why do you have to do it that way? Because God says. The best way for Christians to respond to the question, what do you think, is, well, let's see what God says. It's the best way for us to respond to that question. Decide for yourself. I don't need to do that. God's already told me what I'm supposed to do. What's your opinion on this? Well, what's God's word say? And we ventured from that too much, way too much. Oh, I go over just a little bit more. Go over to First Thessalonians chapter two, just a couple pages over. You have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First Thessalonians. So four books over, small letters. Look at what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spiritually treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God, the speech to you, the gospel of God, and much conflict. So in speaking this message, there was conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. You know what Paul is saying there? You know the conclusion in verse number four? He's going, the gospel that God has given us and entrusted us with, it's not going to be a popular one. But his authority and his boldness is the one in whom we stand and give it. And we're not getting it to make you happy. We're not getting it to tickle your ears. Paul warned Timothy about the same thing. And just so we're looking at this and saying, are we really, I mean, pastor, are we really interpreting this properly? Who's the perfect example in all the scripture? Thank you. I mean, there's only one perfect example in scripture, folks. Come on, an easy answer. The only perfect example is Jesus. Let's go back to what we've already studied in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Turn back there with me. Remember, we're asking ourselves in our conclusion, how do we determine if we're seeking the praise of God or man? We said by the fruits that we're producing and by what our focus or who our focus is on. Go back to John chapter 5. This is where, remember, once again, people were challenging Jesus' identity. Who do you think you are in saying these things? You're not really the Son of God. You're not the Messiah. And he gives a fourfold witness. The fourfold witness in verse 33, the first one was John the Baptist himself. He has borne witness to the truth. In verse 36, Jesus said the works that he did bore witness of who he was. Verse 37, it was the Father himself. In verse 38, it was his word. But let's go back and read just a couple of these verses as to what Jesus is saying when people are challenging his authority in who he was, both in his identity as well as in his message. In verse 33, Jesus says, You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man. But I say these things that you may be saved. This, this goes with our Sunday school lesson, and I talked about this. You see what Jesus just said here? The message of salvation is not what sinful man wants, but it's what they need. I'm not looking for your approval. I'm giving you what you need. And that's salvation. 
Now we're on in verse 35. He says that John, he was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. You want to know why they were willing for a time to rejoice in his light? Because they liked what he had to say for a while, but then it started getting too personal. So you hit the road. We don't like you anymore. Same thing with Jesus. Well, that offends me. I've said it. I said it six years ago when I came here. I, I had an older pastor tell me this. Remember, people will love you till you say or do something they don't agree with. And it's like that as Christians. We love each other until you tell me something that I don't like. But Jesus is saying, you know what? I'm not looking for your approval. Verse 35. Excuse me, 36. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you. Because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures for in them you think. You have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. One more time, I do not receive honor from men. You know what the skinny translation of what Jesus is saying here when he says that I don't receive honor from men? I don't care what y'all think. Because I'm doing what God has called me to do. And the works, and the fruits of the works that I do, and the word that I give is in alignment with his accord, is in alignment with his standard, and that doesn't make you happy. But I don't get my honor from you, I get my honor from him. And if we make decisions according to God's truth and God's standards, you're going to have people who disagree with you. You need to, we need to come to grips with that reality. And you want to know some of the people that will disagree with you the most? Parents, listen up. Your children. Yeah. Oh, you're making decisions. You're trying to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. You're trying to teach and our God. This is so stupid. <laughs> My friends' parents don't make me do this. You know, let me make this clear to you. I don't care what your friends think of me. I don't care what your friends' parents think of me. You're my responsibility, and I love you. And you don't understand some of the decisions that I'm making right now. And you're convinced that I'm trying to do them and make them to make you miserable. But one day, you will come to the point of realizing that I have made decisions that are unpopular with you, uncomfortable with you, they don't fit your preferences, but you'll thank me one day. Because you'll understand that my love for you runs deeper than your approval. And if you love your Lord and you want your children to be raised in that admonition, stand on the word of God. Love you, kids. Love you. And so in accordance to God's standards, we understand that a lot of decisions are going to hurt, are going to be difficult. You're not going to like them. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean that we don't care about you. And I think that we're all intelligent enough that we can connect the dots and every other facet of how that applies. <coughs> Then look at what Jesus says in verse 42. He says, But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Now listen to verse 44. How can you believe to receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do you know what, God, what Jesus is saying there? He's saying... Receiving the sinful approval of the people that you're surrounded with who share the same opinion that you do does not validate your actions or your opinions. You look hard enough, you can find somebody who will agree with you or feel sorry for you. But now let's come back to the point of our text this morning. Who are you looking to please and praise? Yourself, other people, or God. Because what it comes down to is this. It, it ultimately, hear me, doesn't matter what other people think. It matters what God says. 
We have to get that in our hearts. What has God told us to do? Where has he called me? What does he say to do in a particular situation or circumstance? How does he want me to conduct myself? How does he want me to respond? How does he want me to run the business? How does he want me to raise my children? How does he want me to love my wife? Or my husband? <coughs> wives, husbands, husbands, wives. It, it all comes down to what God says. Who are we pleased to see? Who are we focused on? So how do we determine if we're seeking the praise of God or man by our fruits, by our focus, and third, by our fears? Who or what do we fear the most? Let me ask it this way. Who are the, we most afraid of offending? Now let me get real, real kind of personal in my world. I, I typically, not typically, um, I try to be as transparent as I can when I teach. I don't do it for entertainment. I don't do it for religion. I don't do it for your approval or my wife's. I believe that God has called us to be who he's called us to be, but allowing him to form us and shape us into his image. And when I tell you that it petrifies me, that I would ever seek man's approval over the approval of my God, it scares me to death. It petrifies me to offend a holy God. And in the, the reality of that conviction is the reality that as a pastor, there are going to be things, whether it be messages that I deliver or decisions that I have to make, that people will hate me for it. But at the end of the day, I want you to know my heart, not arrogantly or callously, stands here. I don't care what you think. And I don't care what man thinks in contrast to what God says. If we want to be a godly church and godly people, then we need to stand on his authority. And Jesus tells us that. Go now to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, just a couple of verses here as we close this morning. Look at what Jesus says to his people. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. We've talked about any kind of events. When? Not if. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. What's Jesus saying there? If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they deny my word and my fruits and my actions, they're going to deny yours. Verse 25, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? You know, this is getting really detailed here. Remember again, he accused of Jesus of being a minister. How much more do you think they're going to say about you? Verse 26, therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who are we looking to, who are we looking to garner the praise of, folks? Who are we looking to please and honor? Are we looking to honor Jesus? Do we want his holy approval on our lives? Then we need to start drawing the hard line in the sand and saying, so here's the biblical evidence of what he's told us to do. Even when Jesus performed miracles, they didn't believe him, they rejected him. His whole life they made accusations and criticism against him, but he never wavered. Remember what we studied last week, 
from the God-given purpose, which was to bring God glory. We can't do that. Paul said that in Galatians 1.10. That's why I chose that as our scripture reading this morning. You can't please God and man at the same time. Now, if you please God and there are other people that have the same heart, of course you're going to be unified. But if we, if we want to split it, if we want to try to do both, it's never going to happen. Almighty God, I come before you this morning. We come before you and bow before you. Father, this is not a message and you are not telling us to be belligerent or arrogant. But you're clear here as you are in the rest of your word. <clears throat> Father, forgive us if we had sought to please man more than we had sought your praise. Forgive us if we love the praise of man more than the praise of God. Forgive us, Father, if as your church or as individuals or as parents or as spouses, if we have lost sight of the fact of who we're trying to honor and please. I pray that you would realign us with that purpose. I pray, Almighty Father, that we would genuinely examine our own hearts and say, who am I trying to to make happen in a circumstance or situation in our hearts, our minds, our homes. May we seek your glory. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe my kids say, Pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. I, uh, I'm under conviction this morning because I, I don't seek to please God in everything. I'm, I'm convicted over some things in my life. I'm seeking man's approval and not God's. Would you pray for me in that, that I would seek his face, his glory? Does anybody just show up and yet see it? Yes. 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 Is there anyone here like last week and see Pastor, I, I need the approval of God in my life because I don't know him as my Lord. I want to know Christ as my Savior. With every head bowed and every clothes. Anybody say, I want to know Christ today, this morning, as my Lord and Savior, garner his holy approval in my life. Would you just look at me and keep looking at me until I see anybody else is looking around? I want to know Christ. Father, how we love you and need you. And I pray, Almighty God, that. We would seek and love your approval and your praise more than that. Father, may we understand the cost of that and the calling of that. May we not waver from it. We love you and we need you. We commit this invitation time to your hands. In the name of Jesus, we pray. It. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. The musicians are going to play and sing, sing with them. If you would like to come and pray this morning, please feel free to do that. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my heart, stay my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Earth and fierce is out and sown.
Next Sunday, walk to Bethlehem meeting. Sunday after that, snack. Uh, Sunday night at Pastors. That's at 5 o'clock. But uh, let's go ahead and be dismissed in an attitude of prayer here this morning. Almighty, infinite Father, we come before you. We praise you. We exalt you as the one true living God. And we thank you for being our Savior. We thank you for being the Messiah. We thank you for your truth. Father, I pray that we would always seek your glory. I pray that we would always seek uh, your face, your approval in all things. Lord, we love you, we exalt you, we commit all things that we have heard into your hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.